the best time to start a 10 year long project is 10 years ago. The second best time to start a 10 year long project is immediately. Welcome to Old Ways Rising Farm. Um, from the nature of this video, I'm going to kind of assume that many people watching it, this might be the first video that you came to the channel with, through. Um, we're going to be talking about survival gardening here. Uh, Old Ways Rising Farm YouTube channel is about all of the skills of homesteading. It's about the building, it's about the making and the infrastructure to maintain a homestead, it's about the growing and the building of a food engine. But this particular video is going to be about how to think through the process of designing a garden that you intend to actually make you not hungry sustainably and independently. Okay? This is not about what I kind of call a pizza garden. Right? A lot of small scale homestead gardens are, I really enjoy fresh tomatoes so I'll plant three of those and I really like fresh basil on my pizza so I'll plant a couple of those. and. I, I like having some um, garden fresh peppers to cut up and dip into some sort of dip, right? So you're kind of gardening for pleasure. But none of those things are going to actually make you unhungry. They're fine. Keep them, right? I'm not saying don't do that because if you're in a really bad situation, having some comfort food is good for your mental health. But that's not what this video is about. This is going to be about how to think through, how to plan out, how to structure a food producing landscape to make you fundamentally not hungry. And that means we're gonna be focusing on staples, especially the starches, okay? So, the first question in this is, how much land do you need to feed a person? And the answer to that, the the true full answer to that question is that there's no answer to that question. <laughs> because there are so many variables that go into this that it is so specific. There is an answer for you in your context with your set of variables. But that's going to be completely different from your neighbor. Okay. So in order to approach this in a broader sense, we need to pick a couple of assumptions and work with those assumptions for a while. And then after we do that, we will pick this apart and talk more about the context specific things. Okay. So the assumption I'm gonna make, now this is clearly an obvious assumption. Any dietitians out there watching, yes, I know this isn't practical, but it's a place to start with sort of a back of the napkin calculation planning, planning scheme. And that is let's take one crop, let's look up its, its average productivity in one area and then assume that's all you're gonna eat for a year. And then ask, how much would that take? Yes, I know it's a little bit ridiculous, but it's, it's really how you wanna to start to like kind of get your hand, head around what is otherwise going to be a very overwhelming scenario. So we need to pick a staple starch. We need that staple starch to be easy to grow. We need it to be able to grow in a large number of areas and we need it to be easy to store, at least in a root cellar, okay? So when I sat down to do this in preparation for making this video, this video was requested by the way, so um, this is in response to some questions I've been getting. And I picked the potato. It's very common in most people's diet. It grows worldwide. Um, it's very productive and it's pretty easy to store and it's easy to propagate. So it, it's a good, let's just kind of like ground ourselves in how many potatoes would it take you to feed one person on nothing but potatoes for a full calendar year, okay? And the answer to the question based on average New England product productivity is about an acre a person, okay? Now, obviously we're gonna wanna grow more on our acre than just potatoes, but we will kind of shove that aside for five minutes and just let's kind of talk about this kind of this conceit for a little bit, just think about structure. So that's a lot of land. And potato is one of the most productive crops. Potato, um, rutabaga, corn, squash. These are some of the most productive, storable staple starches. Okay. If you're going to feed yourself on nothing but those, 
You'll guess fairly similar land calculation no matter which one you play with. Okay? You're going to have to be planting about an acre every year for every person that you're feeding. So if you're an average family of four, that's going to take about four acres of land. Okay? Now we don't just want to grow a potato. And that's a lot of work especially if you're coming to this without a whole lot of equipment, even with just a hand push rototiller. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of fertilizer. That's a lot of investment. So we also want to think about ways to extend that to bring down that investment a little bit. But all of those ways take time. My quip about a 10-year project is not a conceit. It's a very literal foreshadowing of what we're going to be talking about as we move through this video. Okay? So if you just say, this year I want to plant enough to feed my family, and you're somewhere in eastern North America, you're looking at about an acre. The richest land with the best climate where you can stretch your season to more than just one harvest per acre in, in eastern North America is southeastern Pennsylvania in the Shenandoah Valley. If you live in that area, you can reduce this estimate a little. If you live in northern Maine, you're going to need more. If you live in Arizona, you're going to probably need 10 or 15 acres a person under production. Okay? So we're not talking about an inconsequential project. Also, the first year in a new garden is not going to be ideal. Especially if you're new to agriculture, um, if you're converting forest to agricultural land, it's a lot of work and it's very slow growing and you're not going to be able to do one acre per family, let alone one acre per person. If you're on old agricultural land or even worse land that has been graded for building, developed land, um, historic agricultural practices and even worse, the grading of a bulldozer, you're scraping all like the best layers of the soil away. Even if they say they put back the topsoil, they didn't rebuild the whole soil structure. There's going to be a video on soil structure, several of them, coming up soon, but there's still white stuff on the ground where I live, and I kind of need to be able to stick to do those videos. So they're coming, but they're not up yet. Um, either several years of tilling and amending the soil, or a lot of upfront investment in raised beds in order to fix that. So if you're a family of four and you say, I want to do this immediately, now we're talking four acres of raised beds to feed the family. That's a lot of money and time. So don't be discouraged by that, but do be prodded by that. If you're thinking of along these lines, if you're worried about the direction that the world has taken, and there is definitely reason to be worried about the direction that the world is taking. I'm filming this in about the third week into Russia's war against Ukraine. Um, get started. We still have access to the normal facilities and supply chains, even if they are not ideal at, at this stage. But we still have stuff, right? But know, from what I've said already, that if you wait to get started until you have to get started, it's too late. If you're starting on a 10-year project, the best time to start is 10 years ago. The second best time to start is immediately. The worst time to start is tomorrow. Okay? So know these numbers and don't wait. Okay, That's my number one tip. And even if you're not super worried about what's going on in Ukraine, the, uh, there's other things going on, right? We're losing, modern agriculture is supported by oil-fueled supply chains. We're losing the cheap oil. I'll put a description in, in, in the description box. I'll put a... a citation for an open access uh, journal article on just how bad the oil economy really is right now. It is peer-reviewed literature, not wackadoodle doodle news.
news stories. Okay. Uh, the only two places in the world that really have easy access, cheap reserves left are UAE and Saudi Arabia. That's it. Everybody else has used theirs up. And the, the hard to get to stuff is not as good and not as useful. So if you get like the barrel counts in the ground, they really don't count because it takes so much oil to get them out of the, out of the ground. You only have a small fraction of that barrel count. Okay. I'll post that story. I'm not going to go into details there now. We're also running out of the ability to irrigate the Midwest, large tracts of Europe, and the entire west coast of the United States. Those areas have very rich land, but it's irrigated agriculture, largely. Okay? The two best tracks of unirrigated land, of, well, of, of rich soil that don't require irrigation, I already mentioned one, central mid-Atlantic United States is this number two, the richest agricultural land in the world is Ukraine. And we're not going to get its production this year, even under ideal circumstances. So there are reasons to be worried about the food supply, even independent of doomsday scenarios if things escalate with Russia. Right? So now is the time to get started if you're thinking about these things at whatever scale you can and grow. That's why I start with, you know, kind of like the realistic estimate of what it would take to do everything just from your garden. Now, what plants do you want to grow? I'm going to try and do this kind of with like a worldwide scope. I live in northeastern North America in a temperate climate. I'm going to start there and then we'll talk about how we can add some things in in other areas of the world. But the first and most important thing is your staple starches. The plants that I recommend you start looking at for production of staple starches are first your root crops. They store well, they're easy to grow. So here in the temper climates, you want to look first at your, your, your top tier plants are potato that I mentioned in my, at the beginning and the rutabaga. They are extraordinarily productive. Okay? And you can use them interchangeably. Rutabagas have a little bit of a hint, if, if you're, you're not real familiar with them, they have a little hint of kind of like a little radishy gaminess. But it's not that profound, and if you're putting some garlic in the scenario, you won't know the difference between it and potato. Mm -hmm. right? So you can use them interchangeably. You don't have to change your diet to grow some rutabagas. Rutabagas like cold, wet climates. Potatoes like warm, dry climates with periodic strong rain showers. So when you have that warm year, your potatoes are going to do well, and your rutabagas are going to be a little puny. When you have that cold, wet year, your rutabagas are going to be amazing and your potatoes are just going to die of blight. So when you're planting in the spring, you don't know which year you're going to have. So which one do you plant? Both. <laughs> right? And then you're covered either way. And you should plant like a little bit more than half of what you want. Like plant two-thirds of what you want in rutabagas, two-thirds of what you want in potatoes. And then if they all grow well, you have extra. And then assuming that most years one won't do as well, you'll have enough. Okay? As you go further south in North America and into warmer climates, the next thing you should think about is sweet potato. It's also very productive. And then when you get into real um, tropical climates, think about true yams, Dioscoria yams, not Epomia yams, sweet potatoes that we call Thanksgiving yams are really a type of morning glory. They're not a true yam. I don't care what they label it at the grocery store or the recipe. It's a morning glory, it's not a yam. I'm talking about true yams, the tropical Dioscoria yams. Um, they are extremely productive and perennial, so you can just plant them and leave them in until you want them. You don't have to pick them and store them, and if you're in a tropical area, you have access to your ground all year. Okay? Then you have, uh, you also have manioc, tapioca, which should be on your radar, and you have um, oka and yacon from the Andes, which are long season, cool weather plants. So if you have a longer season, you can think about adding those in. Um, the next tier in terms of productivity is going to be your carrots, your beets, your radishes, and your turnips. So you can start to mix some of those in. They're, they're about two-thirds as productive as the top tier that I mentioned. 
And if you think, oh, that idea that he just said about yams where you can just go and dig them up anytime you want, sounds good, but I live in a cold climate. What could I do like that? The answer is Drew Smartichoke. Do you remember the sunflower family? They're a North American domesticate. They are, when you cook them, it tastes a little bit sweeter than a potato, otherwise indistinguishable from potato. So you can leave them a little bit crunchy if you want, but if you cook them all the way soft, you won't know it's not a potato. It will just be a little on the sweet side. Okay? And you plant them once, and then you can harvest them whenever. So other than absolutely the dead of winter, anytime you can stick your shovel in your ground, you can just go and pick some. Right? Uh, middle of summer, they tend to like shrink and get a little soft because the plant is ripping nutrients out. So... There's kind of like a little window there where they're not ideal. But middle of summer, you have plenty of other stuff growing, so you're not going to really want to do that. Spring and fall, great. So that's kind of similar to the yam story, but in a temperate climate. You can think about those. Um, second thing to be on, second staple that's readily storable, even easier to store than the root crops, are your cereal grains. Now, most cereal grains have a, um, when you look at the gloom structure, they have a husk which clings tightly to the seed and they require some special equipment to process. The exception is corn and wild rice. So wild rice, not really gonna talk about, that's very much a special case, but corn you can grow worldwide. And corn maize, you should have that on your radar and should be planting some of that. You should be planting substantial territory. You need at least 100 corn stalks to get effective pollination and they need to be fairly close together. Okay. But if you look at the tonnage per acre, it doesn't look as high as potatoes, but they have much less water content. So it's a much more concentrated starch. So calories per pound is going to be different, right? It's like comparing um, a loaf of bread to a handful of dry pasta in terms of calories per pound, right? The bread is mostly water, the dried pasta is not, okay? And um, that is, that is a good second thing to think about that you should include. Again, corn will do well in different climate and weather conditions than the other things. So the more you increase your diversity, the more resilience you have. So spread your acre per person out on multiple cereal grains. On multiple starches, I should say, including cereal grains. Um, then the third storable staple, staple starch that you can grow worldwide is squash, winter squash. Okay? There's four different species. Some of them will grow in just about anybody's conditions. Also, squash are a perennial. In cold temperate areas, we grow them as an annual. You plant them, they take four months to start producing, we get one good crop and then they're killed by frost. But if you grow a pumpkin in Hawaii, you plant it once, it takes four months to start producing and then it will produce continually for years. So this is an advantage to being in a warm weather area um, you know, here we have to take all of that land out of production, we get one crop and then you have to store it over the winter and we'll get another one until next fall. But if you're in an area where you have year-round warm temperatures, right, um, wet regions of Mexico, Hawaii, high elevation Andes, you know, these areas where the pumpkin will still grow, um, you can get a continual crop. That changes your calculations on how much land you need to feed a person. Because instead of taking an entire calendar year to get one flush of growth, you take half a calendar year to get your first flush of fruit, and then you get another flush every month, really, from that point forward. So it's continual production that shrinks your land use. Um, that's definitely a thing. Now, we can't survive on nothing but starch. We need protein. So where do your proteins come from? The things I'm going to recommend are beans, peas, and nuts. Okay, We'll talk about nuts continually here as we, we, we move along, but all of these things are high in protein. Right? So you want some production, assuming we're just talking about annuals, 
you're going to want to take a consequential portion of your space and grow some beans and peas on. That also will let you use your vertical space. You can interplant them with the corn so you don't need extra territory. You can get a double yield from a cornfield if you're planting your beans and your squash in it. So again, this is a way in temperate climates that we can shrink the land use. This is the Three Sisters planting, a traditional Native American, Native American um, planting style. It also included sunflower, Native American, another one of our Native American domesticates. And this leads to the next thing we need, which is oils. You need oils in your diet. In the Hudson Bay Company, um, 17 and 1800s, they would talk about rabbit sickness, which was a condition where their traders would get into the middle of winter, run out of food, eat nothing but lean game meat, and die of dysentery because they weren't getting enough fat in their diet. So you need fats. Okay, You need fats. So sunflowers will give you those fats, the sunflower seed. So that's an important thing to include. And you have some in some of the beans and peas, not a lot. And you have a lot in nuts. This brings us back to nuts. Planting some nut trees. So there's kind of your core things. Those should make the core of your, your planting. Now, if you want some of like the pizza garden ingredients for comfort food, yes. But do that second, not first. Herb garden, also wonderful. Do it second, not first. Right? You need some of those things for your mental health. Right? That, that's important. But it's mental health food. You're not going to be not hungry because you planted an acre of tomatoes. You'll have plenty of salsa and nothing to put it on and you're still hungry and sad, right? Plant the things that make you not hungry and sad. <laughs> and then consider your tomatoes and condiments. And do a little bit of it, right? Everything I'm saying is also true if you want to plant a garden to supply a food bank. Same sort of, same sort of uh, logistical thought process. Now, everything I'm talking about up to this point is intensive gardening. Intensive gardening is in, in the modern in the modern context and, and sensibility is really an extractive process. In the spring you add fertilizer, in the summer you grow the plants, in the fall you remove it. You have removed the fertility of the soil and you have to add more next year. Okay. So it is a consumptive process. What we really want to get to, and this is where we get into longer time frames is we really want to get away from consumptive process gardening and move toward a food engine concept. Okay. A food engine is the idea that you can design a landscape in such a way that it will continually produce no matter what you do. The engine will keep running and all you have to do is occasionally maintain it a little bit uh, occasionally fertilize some key portions, occasionally plant some key annuals and harvest. But by and large, the system is chugging along at a baseline level even if you do nothing for a few years. That's what we want to get to. To get to that, we need perennials, and perennials take time. Okay? I've already mentioned one, the Jerusalem artichoke. Others in northern climates include things like a lot of the, the vegetables that we harvest in the spring. Think rhubarb, think asparagus, um, think some of the perennial greens, think um, um, like sorrels and things like that. Um, think your uh, like giant false Solomon seal, things like that that are perennial pot herbs to harvest in the spring. These are very, very important. You start doing research on any colonial, pre-colonial, and indigenous gardening scheme in a cold, in a winter cold climate, and there is substantial land area committed to stuff which comes out of the ground immediately on the spring fruit, on spring thaw. Spring is not a time of plenty when you're trying to be self-sufficient. It is the hardest time of the year. Fall is your time of plenty. That's the harvest season. Spring is rough. 
Summer is moderate because there's a lot of stuff growing to, to forage from. So these perennials which pop up in the spring are very important. Okay. They all take one to three years to establish. But once established, they're extremely hardy and they take care of themselves. Okay. Next is your fruit and nut trees. Again, they take multiple years to establish. Don't, when I talk about home orchard, if you're a person of European descent, your immediate thoughts are going to go to apple trees. But you know, apple trees are not great for making you not hungry. They're wonderful, delicious treats. Yes, you can dry them, um, you know, dehydrate. Yes, you can can applesauce. And you should have a couple. But they're not going to produce a storable staple. What will are your nut trees, which both have lots of carbs, lots of proteins, and lots of fats. Okay? So the focus of your early home orchard production should be on nut trees, not the fruit trees. Okay? Um, start with your chestnuts. They're the most productive. They're very oily. They're very high in protein. And they'll, the Chinese chestnut is a desert tree. It will grow in very low water conditions and it will be um, happy for hundreds of years and will start producing in three to five. Gets really good 10 to 15. This is that 10 year time frame. But now is the time to start because if you wait until it's the last opportunity to use the mail system to mail order your roots, you're not going to have anything for a while. Right, so you need to get it in the ground as soon as you can. Um, then think about your longer term nut trees. So there's people that are breeding acorns that are low in tannins and don't require as much processing. Um, acorns are toxic to humans, right, when they come off the tree because they have so much tannic acid they will just eat, the, eat your stomach lining to disaster. Okay? So you have to process them, but there are easier to process strains of acorns that are being produced for human consumption these days. Um, they take 5 to 15 years for the fastest growing hybrids. Um, pecans take 20 years to start producing and 30 or 40 to get really good. Hickories take 30 or 40 to start producing, 60 to 80 to get really good. So these are longer term things. You should still plant them but get your chestnuts in first, then get these in. Then think about your fruit trees, because you do need your vitamin C producers. You need a diversity of things, right? You need your leafy greens, not just your root crops. You need your vitamin C, not just your, um, not just your nut trees, right? So think about some of these things with, that have a high flavonoid content, a high vitamin content, that have some absorbic acid in it. And based on what grows in your area, start including them and then look into ways to preserve these things that don't require canning. So think about drying apple schnitz, apple slices, right? Um, you can dry, the, the dark leafy greens are very important to include in your garden. I kind of skipped over them a little bit because I'm focusing on the staples. But these are some kale leaves that we just hung in the pantry to dry. And this can just be crumbled into a super stew and you're getting all the nutrients that you would in kale. Okay? And they kind of go to nothing. You don't even notice they're there. Right? When you do this. Stir fries, anything like that. So when it's time and you can do this with any of your cabbage family leaves, you know, even like Brussels sprout leaves and things like that, you can hang them and dry them. Some of these might actually be Brussels sprout leaves mixed in here. I'm not sure if that bundle has any or not. Um, but you can do this with your beet greens, you can do this with your chard, you can dry them. You can make, um, you can make like traditional Native American wasna and wojapi. You can make these like, like fruit leathers. You can make pemmican, you can preserve these things in those ways, but you need to be thinking about that and you need to be planting in line with what you can preserve in a certain time frame. So if you have two or three apple trees, quit and move on to something else. Plant some blueberries. Think, how many blueberries will I have time to harvest and dry? Once you have that many num that number of blueberries, plant something with a different ripening season. Right? 
plant some wild plums, plant some strawberries. Get this spread out so that all year long you have just what you can handle to dry being produced. Well, these things are perennials, so you'll invest in them once and then can pretty much ignore them from that time forward. Three to five years down the road, they start producing. So distribute your efforts. Start your garden and then move into building out your food engine. Some books to think about that I would recommend. Um, this is the Encyclopedia of Organic Gardening. It's very old. There's a ton of these on the market. You can probably get one on a used bookseller for single digit bucks. Um, I mean, depending on the day and when you try to do it, right? It's, it's used booksellers. What's available is what's available. Um, this is a Rodale Press book. Even if you don't care about organic gardening as a principle, this is focused on things that you can do on farm without needing a lot of external inputs. This is a good reference. When you start thinking about perennial foods, perennial vegetables, um, sustaining home orchards, and building the food engine, this is what I would recommend, this set, Edible Forest Gardens. Um, it's not a cheap set. Down? Is it a frame? Okay. It's not a cheap set. But there have been enough copies out of starting to get to the point where you can start to get some used. New, I think it's like 120 bucks. At least that's what it was when I bought mine. 120 out of 30, something like that for both volumes. Um, get both volumes. This has most of the contextual information and some key, like a list of the 100 most important plants to work with first. This is a complete reference for anything you'd want to know. Okay, So get that set. And then if you want to look at traditional home garden structures, this gives a great bit of detail. It's focused on mid-Atlantic Pennsylvania Dutch culture, but it gives comparisons to a lot of other world cultures in how gardens were structured in the 1700s and late, med like from the late medieval period to the 1700s. Focused on the 17 and 1800s, but going back in time for context. The title is Heritage Gardens, Heirloom Seeds, Melded Cultures with Pennsylvania German Accent. It's a very good reference for that particular time period. It's not a real well-known book, but it's got a lot of detail on Pennsylvania German gardening, just as an example. And it's a very well-documented example that represents a broader pan-European cultural complex. Right? Um, also, I have done a number of videos on specific examples of historic sustainable sustaining agriculture I will put a link up to that playlist here so you can look at, at some of my content on that as well so that's uh, that's some thoughts there now you might have noticed I have quite a number of props out here on the table the next thing that we need to talk about in terms of building your food engine is the animal component the land needs its animals and you need animals to do things that you can't do or don't have time to do and eat things that you can't eat. So we need to take those grasses and forbs and brush that we can't use directly for a material or a food and turn them into something that we can use for a material like sheep's wool or a food like chicken eggs. And in choosing your animals, the considerations are really size and diet. Size varies widely within any species. I'm not really going to delve into that here, but I do want to talk about diet. And I want to talk about diet by looking at some skulls and the teeth. I'm going to start with these because they're big. Okay. These are fossil extinct animals. <laughs> right? You're not going to raise either of these on your farm, but it's going to illustrate tooth shape. I'm going to start with the true herbivores, and there's two extremes, and these represent the most extreme of the two extremes, which is why I have them, and they're big, so they'll show up well in the camera and on your screen. This is a woolly mammoth tooth, one tooth, they were big. This is a mastodon tooth, the extinct mastodon. Okay. Now, the words you need to know here are hypsodon and brachiodont. This is brachiodont, this is hypsodont. Halfway in between, we call mesodont, middle, middle dentition, right? The hypsodont tooth, this guy, 
is focused on eating grass. Grass is very abrasive, so it's got a very tall, very thick tooth. So it has a lot of room to wear down and still function. And then it has a lot of folding of the enamel layers. Okay? You can see how the dentine is worn down, but the enamel layers are proud. Mm -hmm. This is the hypsodont condition. Also, you notice it's dead flat. So one of these grinds against the other, and grasses are small stems. So this is um, a mortar and pestle for grinding grasses to pulp. And it has to be flat. If you have a real spiky tooth and you try to eat grass, it's just going to ball up and wad up like a horse that's quitting. Okay. Um, this is the extreme case. The, ma the woolly mammoth could not eat non-grass. Same is true of the horse. Of the non-extinct critters, the horse is the most extreme hypsodont animal, with well, equids in general. Okay? They eat grass, period. Yes, they'll grab some alfalfa that comes along with it. Yes, they'll chew on some little brush just for a little diversity in their diet, but they eat grass. Given unlimited access to unlimited plants, they will still have a diet which is 90% or better grasses, and the rest are just little snacks. This is extreme brachiodont. You see how the, the cusp, I mean, these are the same size animal. And if I hold them here and here so that the roots are at the same level, notice how much shorter this one is, okay? And spikier. The mastodon was eating woody vegetation. These are like log dogs for grabbing and shredding stems, woody stems, okay? The mastodon was incapable, was as incapable of eating grass as the woolly mammoth was incapable of eating a tree. Okay? So this is the extreme. Now, how does this equate to critters that we know? I don't have a deer skull with me, but a deer skull, white-tailed deer, is this type of tooth. Obviously, there's a huge difference in scale. Okay? It's extreme brachiodont. You can raise deer as, as an animal. Um, but you can't feed them grass. Their natural diet is, if their natural diet exceeds 10% grass, their teeth wear so fast that you're cutting their lifespan in half. Their natural diet is 90% browse. Okay? Horse is the other extreme. I also don't have a horse skull with me. Uh, but horse is this extreme, just again, different, obvious difference in scale. They need to be 90% grass. If you try to feed them on browse, it ain't going to work. Most of the critters that we raise on pasture are a hypsodont teeth with a mixed feeder diet. Hypsodont or mesodont, okay, the middle condition. This is a small cow skull. You can tell it's a calf both because it's fairly small and not all of the molars have fully erupted. Right? So this was a young one. And if you look at the tooth on side, you can see it's got a lot of height because it can sustain a grass dominant diet because the teeth is tall. And it's a mixed feeder because you still have some points. They're flat enough they can grind grass well, but they have enough points that they can eat browse. And this is where most of our, um, the ungulates that we raise in captivity are. And there's a bias in domestication toward mixed feeders because they're easier to feed. So the cow is a mixed feeder that favors grass. Sheep is a mixed feeder which favors grass. Goat is a mixed feeder which favors forbs. And deer is a dedicated browser that will eat forbs and grass occasionally. So you have that continuum. So if you have, if you have property where you have acreage for grazing, think about what's on it. Is it mostly brush? If so, raise deer or goats. Is it mostly grass? If so, raise equids, cows, and sheep. Is it in between? Raise sheep and goats. Okay? Think about those things. And if you don't have a lot of acreage, then you need the third category we're going to talk about, which is true omnivore. There's two domestic animals which are true omnivores. They are the chicken and, well, the the gallinaceous birds that we've domesticated really, right? Ducks are kind of, ducks are not quite true omnivores, but they're definitely insectivores, right? But chicken is a true omnivore. 
You can feed chicken a lump of steak and it will eat it. You need to cut it up a little bit and it will be just fine doing so. And you can feed it grass clippings and it will eat them and will be just fine doing so. The chicken is a true omnivore, so is the turkey. And so is the pig. And this is a pig skull. And if you look at the pig's molars, it is a quadrate molar just like ours. The pig can literally eat a human diet. So if you're watching this and you're thinking, I need to be fully self-sufficient soon, you, you should be thinking about animals in terms of omnivores first. Chicken can do the magic trick of taking a worm and turning it into an egg, right? And a pig can do the same magic trick. And a pig has the advantage of giving you large amounts of fat, which, as we've mentioned, you need in your diet. Chickens will, too. Chickens will, too. Schmaltz is a thing. So um, they'll give you your fats. And the, these guys will take completely, these guys will take completely inedible to you plants and turn them into edible to you meat as well as fiber and leather and those other products. Horn, very useful. And the chicken and the sheep can eat all of your scraps. Okay, So if you have chickens and sheep, you will need to feed them, or sorry, chickens and, and pigs, to speak. You will need to feed them, but you can feed them literally anything you can get your hands on. Okay, So that's an advantage there think about how they may or may not fit into your particular context. There's no one correct answer. And then the, the next thing we want to talk about in terms of thinking about, so start with your garden, then expand toward building a food engine, and then expand your food engine by gathering in your periphery. Okay, How do we do that? Well, the first and most obvious is gathering plants. Now, just like there are a large number of poisonous fungi, there's a large number of poisonous plants. You need to do your research. You need to invest a large amount of knowledge. Time. You need to invest a large amount of time building the knowledge to do this safely. Okay. The plants I would recommend that you get started with are the quinopods, the quinoa members, like goosefoot, and um, is one. There's some edible quinopod anywhere in the world, even if it's a, even if it's just an agricultural weed that's come in since Europeans have gone everywhere. Right. So our camp follower weeds are largely edible. Right. Think about goosefoot. Go look up goosefoot and learn to identify it. It grows in ditches in the middle of New York City. Mm -hmm. Right. It's almost universally applicable. Some one of its edible relatives is universal. Okay. Then another one to think about that's also worldwide in distribution is cattail. Okay, cattail, every part of it is edible. You can make bread out of the pollen, and it's 30% protein. You can harvest the roots. You can use, you can harvest the young shoots for food. The older leaves you can use for basketry material. And if you're actually thinking about preparing for like a full-on, the world went crazy, grid down scenario, basket making is a skill that you should cultivate. Right? People like to put up the Rambo macho skills on YouTube, but they're really not what's going to get you through it. They really aren't. It's going to be, can you forage and make a basket to carry your stuff home? That's going to be whether or not you make it through it or not. Mm -hmm. um, so forget the Rambo Macho nonsense and learn to weave a basket. <laughs> or grow a gourd if you don't want to weave a basket, right? Grow a gourd. That works too. Um, so cattails a second, and then sedges. Look up sedges. Look up chufa. Look up yellow nut sedge. There are a large number of, is a general category, nut sedges that produce a tuberous root. They're not, most of them aren't all that delicious. They're kind of fibery, but they're completely edible and non-toxic. And they have been used worldwide as a food source. A lot of them are in this category that anthropologists will write up as eat occasionally in springtime, which means, um, They'll keep you alive, but you really don't want to do it for too long because <laughs> they're gross or, like, painful to chew, right? But learn them. They occur worldwide. Learn to identify them. They're something that you can 
learn quickly and there aren't a ton of lookalikes. Now, do be careful of bad bulbs, right? Death commas in, in North America. There are bad bulbs worldwide. So when you start talking about bulbous things, make sure that you know in your area and your context what will kill you and how to distinguish it from what's edible. Right? So when you're thinking about gathering, if you have a good cattail patch, you can gather enough um, food for a year, or for, or for to get all the way through winter, in a time frame measured in, in days. Right. Um, the next most important thing in terms of gathering is um, hunting. Or sorry, I'm sorry, fishing. Hunting's number three. So it takes a lot more energy investment to catch fish than it does to gather some tubers out of a large patch. But fishing, and I'm talking about panfish here, I'm talking catfish, small sunfish, um, tilapia, cichlids, you have some of these worldwide, right? Panfish, okay? And the ability to produce some fishing equipment that will let you catch panfish efficiently is an important survival skill if you're thinking along these lines. Fishing is not as efficient as gathering plants, but it is vastly more efficient than any kind of hunting. Okay, So provision yourself with the knowledge to make some of your own fishing stuff. That's, that's a good thing. And then when we get to hunting, I don't know how many times living in rural America I've heard somebody say, I'm not worried if the world comes to an end because I can always hunt deer. And as soon as I hear that come out of somebody's mouth, I immediately dismiss the rest of what they have to say. Because it's a stupid comment. I'm just going to be blunt on this. Everybody thinks it, which means the deer population will collapse within a month. If you're listening to this, think, well, I can always default to deer. Wrong. Dispossess yourself of that idea as quickly as humanly possible. Any form of hunting is less efficient than fishing. Fishing is less efficient than gathering. But the most efficient form of hunting is snaring rodents. That's where it is. Snaring rodents is a viable way to put some meaningful food on your table. Rabbits, squirrels, birds, game birds, ducks during the migration season, those sorts of things. That's where you can actually provision yourself. Large game, nope, not in the modern world, not going to work. It'll all be extinct. And you'll still be starving because you thought the stupid thing that that would get you through long term. This is not the 1700s. You are not in Montana in the 1700s surrounded by unlimited buffalo. And by the way, we proved that those buffalo are not unlimited. You're a modern person in the modern world that is populated beyond its natural carrying capacity and is held there by oil. Large game will be extinct quickly. If you're thinking about hunting for food, you want a method of gathering small game that is silent. Because as soon as you discharge a weapon, you've made yourself a target. Right, because somebody wants to take your weapon and, they want, or, and or they want the food that you shot or both. Okay, so that's what you really want to think about in terms of hunting. It's a silent means of getting small game. That's what's actually maintainable. But you also need some pigs, chickens, or nut trees to supply the fat. Because remember what I said a few minutes ago about the Hudson Bay Company and rabbit sickness. Lean game kills in a starvation scenario, in a starvation situation. Will not get you out of the problem. You have to have another way to get oils in your diet. In the modern diet with fast food and you can get butter for like a dollar a pound, we're trying to remove oils from the diet. But if you're talking about a grid down starvation scenario, you're thinking about how to get oils into your diet because they're rare in the world. You are born pre-addicted to fat, literally. It's wired into the brain because it's rare. So you get a dopamine response when you consume oils to get you to eat all that's in front of you because you might not see it for months. Right? That's how human physiology is really built. 
Um, and then when we have a, a world with dollar a pound butter, that goes haywire and we end up in a maladaptive behavior pattern. Okay. But if you're thinking about uh, like any kind of live off the land scenario, you've got to think about how to get oils into your diet and keep them there. Animals. Okay. So, um, there's some other things in gathering that might not be thought of. One is where can you get some concentrated sugars? This is where fruit trees can really shine. Okay. So, and, and even some not fruit trees. Right here, I have some maple brown sugar. The maple trees take care of themselves. This is brown sugar from four gallons of maple sap, of sugar maple sap. Mm -hmm. okay. It's boiled all the way down to ground sugar. This does not need canned. This will keep. This is shelf stable. It can be reconstituted to syrup or used in any recipe where you would use brown sugar. Okay. And I don't have to do anything to keep the maple trees around. I just have to respect the resource and not destroy them with my tapping efforts. Right? So I have to be responsible and proactive in that sense, but I don't have to do anything to produce or maintain them. I just have to not ruin them. Okay. Um, if you're listening to this from a tropical region, there are multiple palm trees that you can tap and boil down to a palm sugar. Right? Even the coconut palm, you can cut the end off the inflorescence and it will drip sap that can be boiled down to a sugar. Okay? So you have access to things like that. You also have access, all the animals that I've talked about here, you fence them in and you maintain them. But there are animals that you can raise passively that will go out and bring resources to you. Think honeybees. Okay. Honeybees go out and forage the landscape for you. They expend the effort. They come back and deposit honey in a comb that you can harvest. And they're tapping a resource that is not guarded or cherished by anybody. Right? They're going out and, and, and getting pollen from wildflowers. They're not going out and raiding somebody's garden. Another is pigeons, dovecotes. You can raise a small, you can have a little pigeon loft, and they will go out, they will forage the landscape, they will eat scraps that nobody's worried about. In medieval times where people would mound grain on piles that were open, pigeons could be a problem, and there were regulations about who could have a dovecote and where and what. But in the modern world where grain is harvested and goes in a silo, that's not a worry. They'll glean the fields, but there's nothing left on the fields to glean. I mean, there, there's no, there's no, nothing left on the fields that people are trying to save. Okay, and then year round, pigeons can find food to keep themselves alive. They will eat that food, and then you can eat the squab. But even more importantly, pigeon poop, pigeon guano is one of the richest fertilizer sources that there is. Mineable fertilizer is a limited commodity that nobody talks about. The only places in North America that we really have mineable fertilizer reserves, phosphate reserves, is coastal North Carolina and underneath Miami. Well, we're clearly not going to level Miami to go dig fertilizer, and the mines in, in, in uh, North Carolina are dwindling and also being built on top of by the coastal cities. So the majority of our fertilizer is imported from, you guessed it, China across the ocean depending on more oil, which as I've already mentioned is dwindling. So fertilizer is something to think about. If you're going back to your acre a person to fully feed yourself from a garden, you need to put fertilizer on that. You can have a small pigeon loft mounted to the side of a building somewhere on your property with a dozen pairs of pigeons in it put some trays underneath that you can easily withdraw, and now you have a fertilizer source. So the pigeons will go out, scavenge the landscape, and bring you back pigeon poop, which you then use for, for your fertilizer. Okay? This is a traditional part of many homestead scale agricultural schemes worldwide. Okay? Um, and everything you do along these lines 
right? This is far more calorie dense than a potato. Also, it's got a lot of mineral nutrients in it. You know, so it's a, a vitamin pill plus sugar, right? So this, I guarantee there's more than 2,000 calories in here, <laughs> right? So um, everything you do along those lines is diverting from your need to have the gigantic garden. Right, so maybe you need an acre person now, and you go and you plant a half acre of chestnut orchard. Well, three years from now, that's now a half acre you don't have to cultivate. And then you find some maple trees on your property or your neighbor's property that's willing to let you tap them. Well, maybe that's another eighth of an acre that you don't have to cultivate. Maybe you build a pond and stock it with bluegills, and just focus on bluegills and catfish. There's a lot of protein you don't need to do, you, you don't need to deal with. You raise some chickens in scale with what your kitchen scraps can maintain through the winter. Their eggs, now you have a source of fat. So everything like this that you do is peeling off garden acreage necessities. As well as diversifying your diet and making you healthier. So think about this on the short term. If you're trying to do something that will fully feed you on the next, fully feed you this year, you're pretty much already too late. But your big garden can fully feed you two to three years from now. Mm -hmm. And then your orchard three to 10 years from now. And then you add your foraging in and all of this together and you get a sustainable, what we call agroecosystem. So again, look at some of my playlists on, on some historic, historic agroecosystems and how they were structured. Right? Look at them for models. Look at, get this book. Right? Get this book and look at the historic agroecosystems in it and how they're integrated across different land, you know, different scales. Um, study some of these gathering things. And maple is not the only thing you can tap. If you're in the south, you can tap walnuts, and you can tap pecans, and you can get a sugar resource. So put all of these things together and start thinking about it. But because all of it takes a lot of time investment, start now. Don't wait for something to really hit the fan, because by that time, you've run out of time. And you're starting, if you start your three-year process of just getting your big garden in, in position and fully productive. When you need that food in three months, you're not going to have a good time of it. So start now. Okay. Um, last thing, in terms of tools, this is a little bit of a rant. If you think you need a survival knife for gathering, this is what you actually need. The majority of hunting accidents are nincompoops with short swords trying to skin a rabbit. Right? You don't need a short sword to skin a rabbit. If you need a survival knife to actually be a survival knife, what you actually need is a hatchet. Right? This is the gathering tool. Also, a survival knife that actually is a survival knife is a crooked knife. Find a blacksmith to make you one of these. It's held palm up, you draw it towards you, you can skin bark from things. There's a lot of times you'll want to do that. There, um, it's a very good woodworking tool. I use this mostly in my carving toolkit. Um, I did forge this one myself. I have a whole video series in progress on making these. And it's got a curved blade, which gives you a lot of versatility and a lot of safety. Full force slamming my hand against the tip of a knife. And it's a very sharp knife at that. No damage to my hand. This is a safe tool. And again, if you're anticipating some sort of grid down scenario, small injuries can lead to gas gangrene and kill you, mm -hmm. right? So a little knife cut is not just a little knife cut. You need safe tools. You don't go foraging with a stupid short sword. Third, get yourself, this is not a folding saw, but get yourself a good saw that's easy to carry and a shovel, small folding shovel, portable shovel. That's what you actually need for gathering and supplying yourself with food. 
Short swords are bad for gathering and bad for sword fights at the same time. They're just stupid, right? Your six inch bowie is a moronic tool for a survival situation. <laughs> this is better for producing wood. This is better for harvesting and, and breaking down materials that you harvest. And a two to three inch knife is all you need to cut a deer. <laughs> okay? Leave the short swords for the mall ninjas. Don't be that guy. <laughs> Get an actual useful toolkit. Right? Um, and what I have here, these are your practical, useful tools for gathering plant materials. And then add in a, a knife about that long, right? Here. Get yourself a Mora knife that long for when you actually need something with a little bit of a point to it for, for processing food, right? These two together for your knives, these two together for heavy removal, and a folding shovel. That's what you actually need, okay, to do this stuff productively. And if you're drilling holes in trees, obviously you need a drill. So, I have, I will put up um, some links in the, in the description to some of these playlists. My playlist on historic agroecosystems. I have a playlist on maple tapping that's still growing. Um, and I have a playlist. I have a, a playlist that's growing. It's it's not up yet on making these. That's coming. And um, good luck to you. But we need to start thinking now about building sustainable communities, where surplus is being produced, not just old stuff stored. And it takes time, so we need to get started. I hope you will like the channel and keep watching as our snow starts to melt and we can start to produce more agricultural videos and like actually talk about the details of applying these concepts. But for now, for early on, when people are starting to get scared about the world and planning for springtime, I wanted to get some of these basic concepts out as quickly as possible. So, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you will like the video so that the algorithm shows it to others. And please, this is one I would really like you to share. People need to think about these things and need some of the resources that I'm going to link in the description. Right? Share this one. I don't say this on a lot of my videos. I, of course, I hope that you'll like, share, and subscribe. But this one, really share out so that people can start to get some of these concepts. With that, I will wish you a wonderful day, and I will see you next time on Old Boys Rising.